I'm going to let Bruce go all nerd on you. This dude's been 30 years with Dow Chemical, I think. Knows his stuff. By the way, I made my kids watch a lot of his DVD stuff. I watch it. He's got a YouTube channel out there that's really nice. Um, and I really like this guy's stuff. I really, really do. So for the nerds out there, he's another nerd in the organization like Dr. Die. You're all a bunch of nerds. Um, the, the credentials, everything. And I'm gonna, I, let's give it up for Pas uh, Pastor Bruce. Bruce Malone. Thank you. I've, I've never been introduced as the guy who's going to go all nerd on the audience, so that's a new one. <laughs> all right, this is my, I think, 10th, but maybe my 11th year at the Creation Expo. And early on, um, Pastor Boyd would have us do two and sometimes three lectures. So I've probably given 20 talks or more at the Creation Expo. 12th year. So I've easily done 20, 20 different uh, talks, different subjects. But they all deal with that unification of what is dividing our nation. Because we have so many different beliefs about reality and the past and where we came from that's diametrically opposed to what God's Word says. Now, let me just summarize 12 years of speaking on my first slide. Tonight, we're going to talk about the awe of God. And I'll explain in a moment why this is so important. I'm going to come back to that. But over the 20 years, I've just done the where, when, how, and so on. Where did all these beautiful animals come from? Well, they were created, completely opposite of what the world tells us. Who created them all? God did, and Jesus said a dozen different ways, He is God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God and became flesh and dwelt among us. All things were created through Him, Jesus Christ. When? If you read the Bible like you would read any other book, to just what means what the words say it means, gives the dates of the chronology of everybody from Adam all the way to Jesus, and it's about 4,000 years, and that was about 2,000 years ago, you would assume it's telling you creation was about 6,000 years ago. I've done half a dozen lectures on how that is absolutely scientifically accurate, and how did God do it supernaturally? So you're not going to reproduce it in a scientific laboratory. God did it, and you can't reproduce it, and that's going to come by faith, okay? But there's evidence to support it. All right. Tonight's talk is really why, you know, I've done the where, the who, the when, and the how, but why does it matter that Christians explain to the world that this is all true? Why does it matter? Because if it doesn't matter to the world, they have their own viewpoint. Why should they care? So this is a really important talk. Now, there's two really important implications of all this. All of us have children, our very children, and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren that are showing no interest in things of God, no belief in God's Word, no desire to go to church. With every generation, it's gotten worse from our children to our grandchildren to our great-grandchildren. It's gotten worse with every generation, every decade that's went by because of two things primarily, I believe. One, they have lost the awe of who God is. Evolution is an acid that destroys the significance of who God is and what He's done. And I'll explain that in just a second with a parable. And second, they look at a world filled with death and evil and diseases and bloodshed and anger, and hatred, and, and disunity, and problems, and they logically think, if God exists, and He's all-powerful, and all-good, how could He allow all this? And if we don't really have a good answer for that, of how to deal with those things, why should they want to believe what we believe? So those are, those are enormous issues, and that's what we're going to deal with tonight. Now, I'm going to do that all of these lectures are basically out of the greatest book of creation in the Bible, which is Genesis. Gives us the foundation, gives us the method, gives us the evidence, gives us the model to understand it all. 
But we're going to spend tonight primarily in the second greatest book about creation in all of Scripture, and that's the book of Job. We're going to spend our time in Job tonight, okay? Now, before that, I'm going to tell a story, and I want you to visualize this as if you are the person I'm describing, okay? Now, imagine you are the son or the daughter of Michelangelo, okay? The greatest potentially artist and sculptor the world has ever known. Unbelievably talented. Well, Michelangelo, when he was in his middle years, middle of prime of his career, was asked by the Pope to paint the Sistine Chapel. Well, he wasn't asked. He was ordered by the Pope to paint the Sistine Chapel. And he didn't want to do it because he wanted to concentrate on sculpting. But you don't disagree with the Pope or you get excommunicated. Now imagine day after day, week after week, month after month, for over two years, you are laying on your back 50 feet in the air with the ceiling a few inches above your face, mixing colors with plaster and creating this enormous, magnificent work of art depicting biblical scenes. And your kid, your you're, dad, play ball with me today. Can't, got to paint the ceiling. Dad, can you read me this book before I go to bed? Can't, got to paint the ceiling. For years, backbreaking work. Historians say he lost his eyesight doing this. He paid a big price, but he had to keep doing it. He wanted to get it done. Now, suppose 40, 50 years later, you're just, you know, it disgusted you because of what you saw it do to your dad. You come to, re to see the Sistine Chapel again for the first time. You join a tour group, and the tour guide's taking you through, and he brings you into this magnificent room, and he says, look at the magnificence of this ceiling. It is miraculous. You see water seeped through the roof, and it picked up various minerals of various colors, and slowly all these biblical forms see, formed all by these random processes and created these beautiful works of art on the ceiling. How would you feel? What would you, what would you say? Not true? Would, would you be irate? You knew what your father had done. You knew who did it. You would want the truth to be known. You would be livid to hear such a lie. You understand the Sistine Chapel is a kindergartner's scribble compared to the beauty of the biological world. And the world around us is pretending random chance processes, mistakes created it all. It is presented as a fact to generation after generation of school children. It destroys their awe of the one who really did it. See, that Torquay could say, oh, that was a miraculous event, pointing to God having done it, but you wouldn't have that same awe of the one who actually did it as acknowledging it was created by intelligence and purpose and meaning and design. You would lose that awe. That's what's going on all around us. The generations are being trained to leave God out of their thinking. But they lose that awe of what God has done. Now, the last half of the lecture, I'm going to point out some of these created creatures. And, and it, is, it, is, it should be jaw-dropping, the kind of stuff God has done. But we're going to start, as I said, with the second greatest book of creation. It's, it's literally the oldest penned book in the Bible. It's older than Genesis. You see, Genesis was written by Moses about 3,400 years ago, based on knowledge and documents from previous, all the way back to, to Adam and Noah, I believe. But still, it was written in about 3,400 years ago. Job had to have been contemporary, probably with Abraham, that kind of time frame, after the flood, after the Tower of Babel. Uh, he lived 140 years after the things of the book of Job happened. He had 10 children. So he had to be at least in his 30s or 40s by the time all the tragedy hit him. So he was in the range of 200 years old or more. 
Well, that's kind of the lifespans of people by the time of Abraham. So that's one of the reasons I peg it at the time of Abraham, plus the things that were happening. So it's a very, very, very old and ancient and fascinating book. Second, it contains incredible scientific insights that you could not possibly know early on in human history. Uh, they had to have been divinely revealed, given things probably told to Adam at the time of creation, walking in the garden. Next, this book, like no other, extensively talks about suffering and pain of humanity. And Job asks over and over and over again, why are these things happening to me? Okay, that's the theme of the book. And it answers it in a very, very unique and interesting way. And last, I think it provides the ultimate solution for those going through problems and issues and pain and interpersonal relationships and financial issues and health issues in their life. And we all will. You understand Jesus said, you will have tribulation in this world. You will be offended. Your spouse is going to offend you. Your children are going to offend you. People who don't have anything remotely close to our faith, they're definitely going to offend us. But will you pick up that offense? That's the issue. Not that whether you're going to be offended. Are you going to pick it up and nurture it and turn it into something that comes out reminiscent of, of what Satan would say and do and act like instead of what Jesus would have us do? Now, let's look at a few of the scientific insights, then we're going to finish up the book of Job and go into this awe of God. You see, Job was rich beyond imagination in his day. Uh, th this is just one statement. He said, there was born, born unto Job seven sons and seven daughters. He had ten children. Now, keep these numbers in mind because they're really significant in a significant important way for each one of us as we get to the end of the book of Job. And his substance, what he owned was 7,000 sheep. Remember that number? 7,000 sheep. That's a lot of sheep. It's a lot of wool. 3,000 camels. It's an unimaginable number of camels. I mean, these sheiks that have these little harems, they probably own hundreds of camels even today before oil was struck. 500 yoke of oxen, 300 donkeys, in a very great household, probably hundreds if not thousands of servants. Uh, he was, the man was the greatest of all the men in the East. And throughout the book, it describes him as someone of great compassion, someone who helped the poor, someone who had great knowledge and people came to him up for knowledge, someone of great political leadership, someone who was greatly revered. There was nothing said that didn't point him out as a phenomenal human being in every possible way. God said, there's no one on the whole earth as righteous as my servant Job, okay? This was a remarkable man. And in the midst of it all, he loses it all. All 10 of his children are slaughtered by a natural disaster. Who's in charge of the weather? Over and over again in Scripture, it's God. You can come to no conclusion other than God allowed it. Now, we can see the back spiritual scene. Job couldn't, okay? All of his wealth is removed, and he comes down with the most horrendous disease imaginable where every square millimeter, every square fraction of an inch of his body was in an excruciating pain covered with oozing sores and boils from the top bottom of his feet to the scalp of his hair. People could hardly recognize him. He looked so ugly and bloody and was in such pain and went to a dump scraping himself with tile. And the response to all this horrendous tragedy, he says, Naked I came out of my mother's womb, naked I shall return hither. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Could we do that? What a man. Amen. And in all of this pain and agony, he did not charge God foolishly, even though he knew God had to have allowed it. Okay? Even his closest ally, his wife, said unto him, Dost thou still remain in thine integrity? Curse God and die. Because he's in so much pain and agony. She's in so much pain. 
he says, she speaketh as a foolish woman speaketh. What? Shouldn't we receive good from the one who made it all and not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. And then for 36 chapters, 36 chapters of Scripture, he has people coming and telling him he must have sinned or bad things wouldn't be happening. If he'd have only done good, good things would happen. You know what that is? That is works mentality. If we do good, we're going to get to heaven. If we don't do good, we won't get to heaven. It's all based on our actions. Everything happens to us is based on our actions. It permeates even Christianity today. God hates that lie of Satan. So Satan sent the most pervasive lie upon a tragically broken man to try to get him to accept it and deny there had to be God to bring salvation upon him. Okay? But it didn't work. But through it all, he still was in agony. We're still in pain. There's no doubt Christians will go through pain and suffering and problems. To deny it is to deny reality. To just say, oh, I claim healing of God. It's like we're using him as a vending machine. He has purposes we can't imagine, okay? Keep these things in mind. So that at the end, oh, by the way, I'm going to do the scientific insights, then we're going to come to the end of Job, and then we'll move on. These are some of the insights from this book of the Bible. It says, Job 26, God stretched out the north upon an empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. Every ancient culture had stories about Atlas holding the earth upon his shoulders, this great godlike figure. Elephants from India having the earth rest upon an elephant's shoulder, the biggest animal they could imagine. Uh, you, you know, even in the Middle Ages, they thought the earth was flat because it was like a table that had to be supported somehow so everything could sit on top of it. Okay, the, these were the permeating thoughts of mankind. The earth rested on something. Now, we didn't find out till the 1700s and 1800s. Now, it's, it's gravitation from Isaac Newton that's causing the earth to be held in position and is literally floating on empty space, nothing. Known 4,000 years earlier. The universe is expanding. In Job it says, he alone spreads out the heavens. 16 different places in Scripture, it talks about the earth, the universe having been stretched out like a curtain or rolled out like a scroll. It's in Isaiah and all sorts of other books of the Bible and Psalms. It wasn't until 1929, 6,000 years after creation, 4,000 years after Job was written, that Hubble discovered it is a scientific fact that the heavens, space itself, is stretching and spreading out, and the galaxies are moving outward. Uh, and it's been confirmed in multiple ways. The earth is rotating. Uh, Job 38, thou hast commanded the morning since thy days. Morning means it's reappearing every day on a regular basis. Morning, afternoon, evening, night, morning comes again. It is commanded to come, causing the day spring. Day springs into existence each day to, to know its place. The earth, and this is implied by the text, the earth is turning as clay on a seal. When you make a pot, it is on a plate a big, like a seal, a big round plate, and it spins where the, that spot just coming around and around and around. It spins around. Scripture is clearly showing the earth is spinning. You know, all the way up into the 1600s, up until uh, the time of the early astronomers, Kepler, I believe, it was a scientific fact, the scientific consensus all the experts go to the science to know all of the planets in the whole universe rotated around the earth, and it sat there and did not move. The sun rotated around the earth. It was a scientific fact. Just because a bunch of scientists are trained to think in a certain way, even if all of them think in that way, they've been trained to think in that way because they're leaving God and Scripture and the possibility of supernatural events out of their thinking. So they have to come to the only possible other conclusion, and they're wrong. 
and they turned out to be wrong. For 4,000 years, they were wrong. God had it right from the get-go and put it down in the book of Job. There are springs in the ocean. Now, nobody could go down deep in the ocean for thousands of years. Hast thou entered the springs of the sea or walked in the search of the depth? Of the depth? Well, it was in the 1967, we discovered enormous geothermal springs spewing millions of gallons of water from deep within the earth up into the ocean. And all sorts of unique, fascinating creatures living around these geothermal springs. Wasn't discovered until the 1960s. Gravity's effect on the constellation. I mean, this one's really cool. Has, canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? Now, those are two constellations. They've been around since the beginning of creation. They are acknowledged as, as certain figures. I, some of them point to gospel messages and, and biblical events. Uh, binding Pleiades means the stars don't move. It's exactly what we now know. Because we can now measure the size of the stars, the gravitational force, and they are bound to each other like they're bound by a chain, and they will not move apart. The bands of Orlan is of, of, of not Orlan, Orlan uh, Orion, I just drew a blank, Orion, is like the belt, the belt on that constellation. Turns out those stars are moving away from each other. They're loose. They're not gravitationally bound. And none of that could be seen by mankind with, with visual images without enormously powerful telescopes in the ancient world. And yet God knows it, and he wrote it down. See, these things are there so we will know Scripture is inspired by God. And lastly, the Ice Age. Hast thou entered the treasures of snow or seen the treasures of hail? See, the Ice Age followed the worldwide flood. All the volcanism, all the land movement heated up the oceans, lots more evaporation, lots more cloud cover, bounced the sunlight away more, and it came down as snowfall for centuries, building up enormous amounts of snow, like nothing the world has ever seen. One-time event upon the earth, explained, predicted, unstoppable based on a true worldwide flood. Snow does not appear in the Bible almost no place. Do, do a, Google, a Bible search of the word snow. It'll show up in Isaiah. Though your sins be as scarlet, I will make them white as snow. That's, that's about the only other time. It appears four times in the book of Job because they knew about all this snow. And there were references to snow there like no other book because the Ice Age was happening during the book of Job. Now, it didn't cover Israel in the Middle East because that's the equatorial belt, but it covered the north and the south of there, and they knew of it, so it shows up. Interesting. Let's go to the end of the book of Job, and then let's go back to the awe of God. After all of this, where Job is crying out, why am I in such agony? Why did I deserve what's happening to me? I wish I had never been born. The day of the curse was the day I was even born. Didn't curse God, but he's in such agony. God comes, and he starts to ask Job questions for four chapters. Question after question after question, example after example after example of what God has made, what God has done. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have understanding. Who laid the measure of all of the universe, if thou knowest? Or who stretched a line upon it? Where is the foundation to which everything is fastened? Who laid the cornerstone where the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? And God just goes on from there, starting at the beginning of creation, the creation of the universe. So Job listens to all this, and this was his answer after four chapters. I know God... Thou, can, thou can do everything. Keep this in mind. And there is no thought that can be withheld from thee. Therefore, I have uttered that which I understood not. Things too wonderful for me which I knew not. I have heard of thee by the hearing of my ear. 
okay? God's talked to him. He's, he's heard all his life about God. He honored and served God. But now my eye seeth thee. Had God, had Job just seen God? Amen. No, I mean, had he seen him? Had he literally seen God at that point? No. But what has Job seen? The things God has made. God, he knows more about God, his character, his creativity, his compassion, his power, by observing those things God has made that he hadn't even been thinking about than everything else he'd ever heard. By looking, by seeing what God has made, he's seen it. And God's pointed out the things that Job has seen. So he abhors himself compared to the power and majesty of God, and he repents in his anguish and his suffering and his giving up on life. And God honored Job for that. Okay? Now, at the very end of Job's life, last thought. And by the way, I'll come back to that in a second, because this is really significant. At the end, this is, uh, and just let me read it, and you can listen. Job 42, verse 12. So Lord, the Lord blessed the latter end of Job's life more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep. Is that the same amount as the beginning? What is it? Double, right? And he had 6,000 camels. Double the number of camels. And he had 1,000 yoke of oxen double the number of oxen, and a thousand donkeys, double the number of donkeys. And he also had seven sons and three daughters. How many children did he have at the beginning? They died. How many children was given to him? Did God double the number of his children? He had 10 at the end, right? Wrong. God doubled the number of his children. You see, animals, they don't have an eternal spirit. People do. This is so significant because all of us have felt the agony of the pain of the death of a loved one. When someone dies, when a human being dies, they're not gone for eternity. God didn't give Job 20 children like 20 of everything else because he already had 10 children. They just weren't physically present with him anymore. See, keep that in mind. That is a truth of comfort for all of us. When our loved ones die, if they have Jesus Christ as their Savior, we will be with them again. We have not lost them. God did double the number of Job's children. Had he given them 20, it would be like those first 10 were gone forever and had never existed. But that's not reality. See what Job does? It gives us this eternal hope. See, the solution to the misery in our life, the offenses in our life, the problems in our life, the diseases in our life, and God can solve them and get rid of them, but more often He lets us go through them because they draw us closer to Him, is to concentrate on that vertical beam of the cross, the one that points to the majesty and the love of the Father who made us. And in the midst of the horizontal problems of life, our focus needs to be looking upward and concentrating on the awe of who God is. And a large part of that is looking at the things He made so we can know like we know nothing else. It couldn't have made itself. It couldn't have just happened. The world is so wrong, and it just it permeates into our thinking too. So let's take a few moments as we wrap up and look at this awe. And by the way, here again is that hope of the book of Job, right in the midst, almost at the center of the book. Chapter 19, there's 42 chapters. Job makes this statement. I love this is one of my favorite verses of scripture. The man who is in the most pain, other than Jesus Christ, of any human being who ever lived. He said, I know, I don't hope, I don't believe, I don't wonder, I know my Redeemer liveth. 
and he shall in a latter day stand upon the earth. Is that talking about Jesus Christ or what? The Redeemer. The one who takes the pain and the suffering and the agony and the problems and he redeems it all and makes it all fair at the end. And he will. Keep these things in mind as you're going through your problems of life. Okay, now, let's take a look at some of this stuff. This morning I gave a version, pretty much the same talk in a church. Um, and I, I called it uh, the bugs, the birds, and the beasts. The awe of God. And we're going to look at some of those. The awe of the one who made it all. I'm going to start with the marine iguana. And by the way, I'm going to do seven, maybe eight of these tonight. And they go pretty quick, so I'll get finished in the next 15 minutes or so. Um, but if you have not given one of these devotionals to your children or grandchildren, man, at Christmas time, as grandparents or parents, put a neat note in the front, say a scientist came to your church or a meeting and started talking about some of these really, really cool animals that couldn't have made themselves. Challenge them to read the day on their birthday. These books are devotionals where every day of the year there's something about an animal or biology or genetics or, or astronomy or some cool thing that God made. And they connect history and science and reality to the Bible. I mean, what better way could we reach the world than connecting all those stuff they consider to be authoritative back to God's Word? It's so powerful of a way to do evangelism. In, in the, um, the one called Have You Considered, and there's three different devotionals, Have You Considered Evidence Beyond a Reasonable Doubt is one of them. On June 7th, it talks about the marine iguana. Now, one of my favorite creatures. It's a lizard, I don't know, about three foot long, lives on the Galapagos Islands, only can eat fish out there in the coral reef surrounding the island, but surrounding the coral reef are sharks. And sharks look at marine iguanas like filet mignons. Oh man, good eating. They don't move very fast. They make a lot of noise. As a matter of fact, when they're down there swimming, they have these big hearts and they're going boom, 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 boom. And sharks have lousy eyesight, but great hearing. They can hear that sound over the waves of the ocean, and they just zero right in, grab an iguana, great lunch, great snack, waiting for the next one. Well, Eric the iguana is, is standing there with, with, I don't know, Irwin, his brother, and Irwin goes out in the ocean, and Eric's watching, and he sees this shark just jump out of the water and go whomp eats his brother. Oh man, what am I going to do? I'm hungry. That shark's out there waiting for me. He just ate Irwin. Man, Eric just doesn't know what to do. Then he has a thought. I know what I'll do. That shark probably heard his heart going, bum, 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 bum. I'll turn off my heart. Then I'll go swimming. So Eric the iguana, and by the way, this is the only mammal, or the reptile mammal vertebrate in existence that's capable of doing this, that has a heart, shuts his heart down, goes swimming for up to 20 minutes with no heartbeat, no blood circulating, just chomping down the fish. Now he just sounds like the waves swishing around him, crawls back up out of the water, He forgot to evolve the ability to turn his heart back on. Bummer. <laughs> now, how does this happen? You realize every part of our body is constructed and built based on the DNA code. It's literally a computer program telling every cell exactly how to interact, what chemicals to make, how to communicate, what to do, how to function, how to come together and work. For an animal to shut down its heart would involve thousands of programming changes, and they all have to be there at once. Now, even one of them doesn't happen by chance in a useful functioning, or actually an increasing complexity way. See, his body has to be able to use muscles without using as much oxygen. His lungs have to stop working at the same time as his heart. 
but he has, it also has to be able to restart up on command. Nothing else does that. There's no transitional link. I mean, we should be in awe that God could make a creature capable of this. And he has. And to pretend a little small change at a time over huge periods of time just explains it. Oh, wow, look at, look at how useful that is. It must have evolved. It's nonsense. The mechanisms, the method, the pathway, the evidence isn't there. And it's nonsensical to believe it could happen a small step at a time. It couldn't. It all had to be there at once. Only creation makes sense when you look at the marine iguana. Now, this is my favorite bird. It's the bar-tailed godwit because it's not called the bar-tailed evolution wit. Okay? Love that name. This bird, again, does what no other bird does. Uh, it loves to spend the winter in Alaska. Okay? Small font, but that's Alaska. But it ha- spends the summer in New Zealand. Goes to Alaska in the winter. I'm sorry, in the summer because there's all sorts of blooms of algae and the whales go up there and the birds go up there and all the other marine animals go up there and they just have a smorgasbord eating each other. And this bird runs along the beach with its long stocky legs and it's eating all sorts of clams and shells and so on, but it starts to get colder toward the fall and it wants to spend its summer, you know, kind of like we'd like to go to Florida in New Zealand. But the only way to get there fast is to fly over 7,000 miles of open ocean. Now, this bird doesn't swim. It runs along the seashore. It flies and runs along the seashore. Um, I'm not even sure when it lands if it's capable of flapping its wings hard enough to get out of the water, but it'll drown. It can't land. If it lands, it's going to drown. So it has to fly nonstop, 24 hours a day, for between five and seven days, depending on the headwind, in order to get there. All right? That's how, that, now, scientists figured out, how many calories does it take to each time that bird flaps its wings downward and raises them back upwards? They can figure that out with scientific calculations. And it knows how many calories it gets from burning the available fat in the bird's body. And it realized it is impossible for the bird to fly for five to seven days continuously because it doesn't have enough calories it is going to nosedive into the ocean and die. But it doesn't. So this gets them curious. And they start studying it as biologists, and they realize the bird gorges itself for the weeks before its journey is about to begin, and its weight goes up 55%. Now think about yourself. If you weigh, say, 200 pounds, and two weeks later you weigh 300 pounds, this bird is now the Goodyear blimp. It's terribly not streamlined. It's not very efficient at flying. And it still won't get there because it's too fat and heavy. Nose dive into the ocean again. So that doesn't work either. They keep studying. They discover it takes all of this food it's eaten that it's turned into fat. And it turns into, to, it into a special concentrated kind of fat. Almost like a tallow that has almost no water. So it's super concentrated food, but it's still too big. So at this point, over the last few days, this bird shrivels up its internal organs, its stomach, its liver, its kidneys, its intestines. They all go paper thin. So now all that fat refills that space and it's nice and streamlined again. So now, that bird can fly 7,000 miles without nose diving and dying. Think of the changes needed in that bird for all that to happen. Before it could ever make the journey the first time, everything had to be there. The knowledge it needed to eat all that food, the knowledge it was going to fly that far and where it needed to fly to, the ability to track the Earth's gravitational field and find its landing spot, the ability to shrill of its organs, the ability to metabolize that fat. You understand the complexity we're talking about? The engineering required for a human being to create such a system and everything has to work together? The awe, the awe of a creator who could plan all this. Why? Why go to all that trouble? So we would recognize his fingerprint behind it all. 
And, and what do we do? We pretend, oh, that's a useful feature. Evolution did it. It's an acid upon the awe of who God is. And it's a lie. The puffer fish, the Michelangelo of fish. Now, I interviewed some, some brilliant scientists for one of these rocks. I, I have an 18-part teaching series that if you want to impact the people in your church, take this video series and use it as a class in your church. People love to connect science and the Bible. They just never get a chance to do it. And it's a great class. And one of the 18 series, I interviewed like some of the most, I think, brilliant scientists in the world. Dr. John Sanford, he's a Cornell University genetic scientist, PhD. John Bob Gardner, one of the top world geophysicists describing how the flood was moving the continents apart and so on. One of them was the head of anesthesiology from La Linda University. And I ask each of them, in your field of study, what's the most convincing evidence that creation is true? This is an answer I got from the, the anesthesiologist from La Linda University. I want you to listen to his answer. I've got to turn on my speaker. And then watch what this fish can do. I would cite that the most original aspect of creation that has impressed me is the reality that in the natural sphere there is beauty in the physical domain and beauty makes no contribution to thickness or to survival. So in one area, Darwinian evolution collapses. Unfortunately, this small Japanese pufferfish is dull, almost to the point of invisibility. But to compensate, he is probably nature's greatest artist. To grab a female's attention, he creates something that almost defies belief. His only tools are his fins. In his head, a plan of mathematical perfection. He plows the sound, breaking it up into the finest of particles. of his construction. He can't rest for more than a moment, but must work 24 hours a day for a week, or the current will destroy his creation. If this doesn't get him noticed, 
just nothing good. Yeah. Now, the, the narrator has been trained to interpret everything he sees by leaving the Bible and leaving God out of his thinking. So the only possible explanation he can come up with to explain that beauty is that that fish is trying to attract a babe. Then they can lay eggs. Well, a, a little mound would do the same thing. And there's no proof for that. It's just storytelling. And they've been using that idea for beauty ever since in every textbook and every university and every museum. Kids are told, oh, flowers are beautiful so they attract bees and so on. Peacocks are beautiful so they can attract a fem female. You know, we couldn't do what that fish does. None of us. See, it doesn't fly up and look at what it's making. It just shoves sand around with its head. Imagine pushing a pile of sand around to make a perfect circle from here all the way out to the road. Perfect circle. None of us could do it. And it's just beautiful and unique. Every one of them is a little bit different. You know, Charles Darwin made this statement. The sight of the feather in a peacock's tail, whenever I gaze at it, makes me sick. Why would he say all that beauty makes him sick? Because he couldn't explain it. Where does it come from? When his daughter died, he was so mad at God at allowing the death of a loved one the, the, the thoughts he'd had for 30 years since he'd traveled on the Beagle in the 1830s, he put into a book he called The Origin of the Species that proposed that everything could be explained without God. And he knew exactly what he was doing. And he wrote, I believe Jerry has the exact number, but something like 6,000 letters over the next 20 years trying to convince the whole scientific community you could explain everything without God. And in multiple letters, he said his goal was to kill God in the faith of millions he succeeded beyond his wildest imagination because the human heart wants to cover ourselves with a fig leaf and escape the accountability of God. And this gave the perfect excuse to do that. But it's an acid that eats away at the awe we should have when we face things like that fish. And furthermore, when you test this idea that beauty, like a peacock's feather, is just there for some functional reproductive purpose, they took a peacock years ago, cut off all those beautiful eye-shaped feathers so the peacock was pug ugly. He was an ugly guy. Sent him into a field with a bunch of females along with a bunch of beautiful peacocks. Didn't make a bit of difference which one they picked. Had nothing to do with beauty. It's, when you test evolution, it turns out to be wrong. It's just, it's not tested. It's not science, it's a belief. I'm gonna skip past a couple of these because uh, I don't wanna to take too long. I wanna do this one because it's short and interesting. The sea sapphire. By the way, they're all in the books. And I've got a resource for all of you at the very end where you can watch a lot of this stuff. It's a little quarter inch long, quarter inch long sea creature, bright blue, sapphire colored. And it's got little scales, microscopic scales on the surface that absorb every color except sapphire blue. And that wavelength of light, when it hits those scales, it will go through and then bounce back. So we see the blue reflected back to us. So the scales are lined up in layers, like one on top of another. And if light's coming straight down, that distance is just perfect for the wavelength to be reflected back. But when that animal turns, and now the light is coming straight down, that path link becomes longer as it goes from one scale to the next, and it becomes absorbed. So in essence, all the light hitting that creature is absorbed. None of it bounces back, except the scales and the rest of its body is kind of translucent, like a smoky glass. And at that moment, when nothing bounces back, you can see right through the creature to the ocean bottom. The creature literally becomes invisible. And you can see right through it as if it isn't there. God, not Marvel Comics, invented invisibility. Watch this little video. Okay, here it is looking straight on. It's about to turn and it disappears. Check it out. It's going to turn and you can see the ocean bottom below it. A creature that becomes invisible. Our jaws should be dropping open. The wonder of it all. And it probably took a million dollars worth of study to figure out how it all happened. And God just did it for our wonder. 
The last two examples, the opu fish. Love this fish. Now, it's a type of fish called a goby, a specific type of fish, and there's no other fish who have this feature, but this is one of the most unique because this particular version lives in the salt water, and the only place the opu fish, the opu fish, is right off the island of Hawaii, the big island, and where it lives, the only source of fresh water is at the top of this waterfall, and it's 420 feet tall. Now, that water comes down and it goes out into the ocean, and the fish live out here in the saltwater ocean, but they have to lay their eggs in fresh water. If they lay their eggs in salt water, the eggs die. No more opal fish. They just went extinct. It has to get to the top of this waterfall to lay its eggs. How does a fish swim up a waterfall that 365 days a year is streaming down 400 feet? Now, I ask this to school children, and they'll answer you with just honesty, and they'll say, it must fly. And I say, well, yeah, there are flying fish, but they don't fly. They just stick out their flins, jump out of the water, and they glide a few dozen feet, get maybe 10 feet off the surface, and land back in the water. They can't go 400 feet high, and they can't flap wings. And some another kid will say, oh, maybe it'll climb. And I'll say, oh, kind of like, you know, Spider-Man. Oh, the Spider-Man fish. And everybody laughs. And I say, oh, no, I know. Like, dun, Mission Impossible. Dun, 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 Where, where, where the, the, the hero, he actually has suction cup gloves and climbs like a 200-foot tall tower in Dubai on the glass panes because of the suction cups. Well, actually, that's what God has given this fish. The only type of fish, and the opu is one of them, who has a suction cup on its stomach. Okay? No other fish has this. So it takes that suction cup, and it runs up to the wall, and it sticks it to the wall, and then it shoves with its fins. Sticks it again, shoves, sticks it again, climbs 400 foot up. Jumps into the fresh water, lays its eggs. They live up there for a few weeks or months until they turn into little fishlings. Then they're flushed down the waterfall and go out into the ocean and live happily till they're ready to climb the waterfall again. Is that stunning or what? What's evolution got to offer? Well, I guess one day a fish was born with a suction cup. Well, here's this little baby fish. Hey, mama, what's that on my stomach? Well, I don't know, Junior. It looks kind of like a suction cup. What should I do with it, mama? I don't know. I know. I'll go stick myself to this rock wall. <laughs> and now I'll push myself 400 foot up so I can for a swim in some fresh water. Does any of that make any sense? Everything has to be there at once. The instincts, the mechanisms, the suction cup, the desire, the reproductive system. It all has to be there or nothing works. See, God does this so we'll know he exists. Not hope he exists, not think he exists, not wonder if he exists. We will know like we know nothing else because we've observed creation. Now I see the very power and Godhead of God. Now, I'm going to wrap up by talking about photofluorescence. You see, there are dozens of totally unconnected creatures that have the ability to make light. Kind of like these light sticks. See, I just broke that one. I don't know if you can see it, but it is now putting out blue light. It's not blue colored fluid. It's creating light in the blue spectrum. Here's one when you mix the two chemicals. And by the chemicals, they're, they're called lufusin and luce. Jerry, what's the second one called? Luciferin, and the second one, the enzyme. Luciferas, or so, it's got, an, yeah. You had to mix those two chemicals. By the way, do you know where those two words came from? Lucerthin and lucer, luf, luceras? They're named after Lucifer. Lucifer will disguise himself as an angel of light. And they named chemicals that produce light after that word Lucifer. And here's one that makes yellow. Okay, it puts out a yellow wavelength of light. So those chemicals, we figured it out after lots of research. But you see them in jellyfish. You see them in algae. 
where you have algae putting out blue light that will cover an entire surf as it comes in over a sandy beach. We'll see it coming off of mushrooms in, the, in, the, in forests. There's some squid and octopus. These are so cool. They actually have moving lights that look like a strobes going across a, a, a billboard and move in patterns across them as they swim through the ocean. Here's a fish that lives like 5,000 feet down in the ocean where no light gets there and it's got a light bulb on a stock. So when fish see it, they will swim closer and it can eat those fish. A little lure that puts out light. Now these are so disconnected creatures that they have totally different computer programming, totally different codes in their DNA genome with, with no known link. They're just suddenly there. Now, a gene is like a page in a book or a chapter in a book. It's, it's, it's completely different than any other page or chapter in the book. These creatures make the chemicals that make the light with information that's totally different than the genes in the other creatures. Evolutionists are forced to believe the ability to make light has evolved about 40 different times in creation. And you can Google this. How many times has, has, has photoluminescence evolved? And, and they, they say about 40, independent of each other. It just happened, the right chemicals. And you have to keep the chemicals apart. Without both of them, the light doesn't happen the way it does and the colors it does and the speed it does. You can still get some light, but it's completely different. And this is the one we, who knows what that is? A lightning bug. Now, here's where I want to wrap up. If God can put a light bulb on the butt of a bug. And that's what he's done. He stuck a light bulb on the butt of a bug. Don't you think his word can light the path of your life? Don't you think he cares about us more than a bug? Don't you think he can light your way through your troubles and problems and knows about them? Think about what he's made and apply how much more he cares about you. And Jesus said the same thing. If he cares about the sparrows and the very hairs and the number of them on your head, he cares about your problems. And they're there for a reason and a purpose. And we brought them on ourselves because we live in a fallen world so we wouldn't live forever and be forever separated from him. But then he died in our place so we can have hope. And he came back to life so we can know there's hope. And we can't solve and be good enough to deserve heaven, but he's provided it all for us. And the part he asks for us is to yield and have faith in what he's done. Now, I want to end with this little video of why perspective is so important. Now, as I step into this room, it should be quite obvious that something is wrong, but can you figure out what it is? Your mind may tell you that I have grown smaller. Of course, you know that that really isn't true. Your eyes, however, are telling you the truth. They're telling you that the floor is tilted up, that the ceiling is tilted down, that the walls are badly distorted, that the windows are almost impossible to make drapes for them. Yes, your eye is telling you all this, but your mind simply refuses to believe. But maybe this will help. Imagine all of this without the benefit of vitamins. But it also works the other way, too. Now, if you'll just step back a bit, you'll see the real cause of the trouble. It's quite obvious that this is isn't it? Sloping floor, tilted ceiling, distorted walls. But uh, since you understand this, you shouldn't have a bit of trouble from now on, should you? Or should you? In this house, faces at the window seem to come in assorted sizes, don't they? But uh, there's nothing wrong with the faces. It's those windows. And what they're doing to your brain, remember? A small one and a tall. Let's see if we can even things out a bit. <laughs> no, they're, they're... That's even worse. 
there's no fake photography here. You're, he's filming this. Most people, when they realize how limited and how inaccurate the human senses really are. You see, your, your, your brain's trying to keep that room looking like a room because it's all you can see. The perspective distorts reality when we have our perspective wrong, when we're only concentrating on ourselves, our problems, our pain, instead of concentrating on God's majesty and our absolute awe of who he is, our problems fade. Christian song after Christian song talks about that. Now, I want to leave you with a, um, a tool. The, this spring, I started filming two and three minute little teachings. They're called without a doubt because our world is so filled with doubts. Now, Here's how you find them. If you go to my website, any of my books, the website's in there. Sign up for my newsletter. It's free four times a year. The website's in there. The first thing that pops up are these without a doubt devotionals. When you click on that, it opens, takes you to the YouTube, and it opens up where you can subscribe. And every week, a little two-minute reminder of the awe of God shows up in your email. And I'm just going to show one of these little two-minute videos and I've filmed 40 of them, and when those run out, they come out one a week. I'll probably film another 40. Um, but here's one of these little videos. And sh send a link to your friends as a reminder. Every day, God's behind it all, because I think this is so powerful. But here's an example of, the, of what this tool is. You know, God told us to take dominion in the book of Genesis. That means to study, understand, and control it. Now why? Because we can learn so much from it. I mean, we can even learn from a slug. A slug, you say? Yeah. It turns out that there's a certain kind of slug that lives in northern Europe that slugs, when they move, they leave a slime trail. It's just kind of a sticky, gooey, watery thing. You can actually see their trails as they're crawling along. Well, scientists started to study this slug from Europe. And they realized their slime is very, very elastic, which means you can stretch it and it'll snap back, and very, very sticky. Now, for years, scientists have used things like super glue to bind up wounds. Uh, and they thought, it's a little toxic and it turns a little brittle. What we need is a really flexible glue that will stay sticky. And they discovered this slug slime. These has the perfect characteristics for glue. Now, don't get too excited about, you know, having some slug slime slapped onto your cuts because it takes a lot of slugs to form enough slime to fit the market. And, you know, slug slime farms aren't exactly practical because the slugs only exude this kind of slime when they're scared. Because they don't want birds. Like if a bird's flying over here, out comes the sticky slug slime glue. And if the bird comes and tries to pull the slug off the sidewalk, it's stuck to the sidewalk. So the only way to get the sticky glue is to scare the slugs. And slug slime farms aren't exactly practical. I mean, you set up a movie theater, you put all your slugs on the seats, and you show them movies of scary birds, and then you Great, the slug slime sticking glue off the seats. I mean, not exactly practical. So what do they do? They figured out how to synthesize it. And we now have the formula for sticky slug slime glue that is currently being used to seal up wounds. Isn't that cool? Because we figured out what God did first. So we can learn from creation develop products that benefit us in a multitude of ways, even slug slime glue. What a slugger of an idea. So, I mean, I just, I, I want you to see it. It's a tool to connect the world with the trustworthiness of God's Word uh, and, and, and bring back that awe of what He's done. So put those to use. Just go to Search for the Truth, sign up, and, and then forward them to other people. And that's what this is all about, giving you tools to impact the world. I went over, as always, I apologize, and thank you for the time tonight. <laughs>